Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to Being Patient Brain Talks. I'm Deborah Khan, founder of Being Patient. A lot of you have told us how hard it is to get an Alzheimer's diagnosis um, or a dementia diagnosis for that matter. Um, a lot of misdiagnosis out there. So we thought we would bring to you one of the best in the industry, Dr. Marwan Saba, who is at Barrow Neurological Institute and joins us now. Welcome, Marwan. Always really good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you. Okay. So why is, let's just start with, you know, we hear this all the time from members of our community that they can't get an accurate diagnosis or it took years or they're still not sure. Why is this so hard to diagnose people with Alzheimer's disease? So this has uh, been the, the kind of the bane of a lot of industries existence is that they're afraid that, uh, you know, there are all these new drugs, exciting developments, and nobody can diagnose it. Fundamentally, it boils down to the fact that primary care physicians don't feel comfortable making a diagnosis. They get 36 months of training, one month of neurology. If they're lucky, they get one day in the cognitive clinic. And yet we lay everything on the back of a primary care physician who does not feel comfortable making these diagnoses. And the consequences is that they delay a diagnosis. They delay referring. Uh, they don't feel like it's necessary to screen patients. Uh, they dismiss symptoms. Oh, you're depressed, you're tired, you're sad, you're this, you're that. But they don't take it on head on. And that's been a problem. Do you think it's because, okay, the first line of, you know, the, the healthcare system, people tend to go to their GPs before they're going to make an appointment with a neurologist. Yes. Um, that discomfort, um, you know, usually I... Most people I've spoken to who I know have ha have gotten a diagnosis, it always starts with MCI. It's never like you have full-blown Alzheimer's. It's like, oh, it's MCI. Right. So tell us a little bit about that. Like diagnosing MCI first, um, I would say, I would venture to say in 90% of cases, it's MCI first. I Why think that, so MCI, of course, as you know, it, it, both MCI and dementia are categorical definitions, Deborah. So that means that it, MCI is cognitive impairment without functional impairment, still independent, but still having some cognitive issues. Dementia is a categorical definition of cognitive impairment with functional impairment. We want to capture people in the MCI phase. I think doctors don't know uh, when the person goes from MCI to dementia. They don't even, in the lay audience doesn't understand that, that Alzheimer's is a type of dementia. So category key, category type, Alzheimer's, uh, category de dementia, Alzheimer's type. And so physicians themselves mix these terms up. But, the, you know, I, I think the, they use the term mild cognitive impairment because they know there's something wrong and they don't want to use the boogeyman word of dementia. So they say it's mild cognitive impairment. And I, I have to tell you, though, that what physicians have learned, and this is the other problem we face, Deborah, is that we learned in medical school that you can only diagnose Alzheimer's with an autopsy. That is still taught to this day in medical school curriculum. Even though you and I spend our day job seeing the newest biomarkers, the newest breakthroughs, the newest this and the newest that, doctors think you can only diagnose Alzheimer's with an autopsy, that you can, you know, you just check a B12, a TSH, and an MRI, and by exclusion, by default, you have a dementia diagnosis, and you know and I know that's just not accurate. Okay, so let's talk about um, let's talk about that a little bit because um, we know that scans are one way. I mean, first the first the first thing a patient is given is a cognitive assessment, right? Correct. And so, and I believe, and I'm not the doctor, and you may agree or disagree with me, but I agree. I think at that early stage, um, it's hard to give someone a cognitive assessment unless you know what their baseline was, right? Before they were yes. experiencing memory loss. I mean, I even tried this on my own mom when she was first diagnosed. I think I gave her a MOCA test every day for three weeks and <laughs> it was vastly different according yeah. to what her mood and her state was that yeah. day. So, yeah. and I know that cognitive assessments usually aren't just those MOCA tests. Those, that's just the first test. Like you go much deeper, but the variance of her scores in just that few week period was vast. I mean, some yeah. days she would nail it. Other days she would do terribly. Yeah. So 
in my opinion, I'm thinking, do those cognitive assessments actually give us a accurate assessment or at least the direction of, of where to go, what to ask next? So I actually uh, feel like that's one of the, the problems and challenges we face as practitioners. And we we live in we kind of bank heavily on what the cognitive test is. I have proposed and published on the idea that we should first do in, informant based questionnaires, and there are ma many of them now. That's to say, if physicians asking an informant information about the cognitive issues, there's uh, the AQ Alzheimer questionnaire, the AD8, the IQ code, and now called the ED EQRS or something. Like that. But these are ways for the physician to capture if there's incident cognitive decline as an added value. I do that before the cognitive assessment. Wait, so, so what, wait, what, what types of questions are being asked on those? So, uh, Alzheimer questionnaire is to the, not to the patient, but to the informant. Is there a memory issues? How long has it been going on? Uh, do they forget uh, appointments? Do they misplace objects? Do they get lost? Do they become disoriented? Do they have problems handling money. I mean, it's a, our, uh, I actually have published a lot on the Alzheimer questionnaire and we use it in our practice. I've been using it for years on hundreds of patients. Correlates very, very well with progression, correlates very well with a lot of other instruments as well. So that's the instrument we use in Arizona, but there are a lot of other instruments. AD8 is the most common, the Alzheimer's disease 8, that's Jim Galvin's the IQ codes, and then a new one called the EQRS. Okay, so those will serve as a guide as to what questions you should be asking in order to Correct. determine if there is a problem. And those are Correct. directed at the practitioner. So, so from to the informant, not to the patient. So, so the the spouse or your, I Correct. guess, yeah, whoever is living with the the Correct. patient. So, when you have that first line of questioning, and then then where would you go to cognitive assessment? Like, what's yeah. next in a diagnosis? So I would do a uh, cognitive assessment. You know, the most common, of course, is the MOCA, but the mini mental, the slums, the mini cog, whatever you're comfortable with. Uh, I actually love, uh, I mean, you're in our business for a long time now. I love Mia Kiva Peltos. Not everybody knows her for the finger study, but well before she ever did a finger study, she did something called the Katie score, C-A-I-D-E. And it's basically a risk score of Alzheimer's. And if you, so I actually embed that in my practice. So if their KD score is high and their AQ is high and their functional assessment st staging scale is high, I know I'm dealing with something in the mild carbon impairment or dementia degenerative in nature. Uh, I also do a Lewy body screening questionnaire. Uh, so what I'm saying is by the time I get to the physical and neurological exam, I can tell if they're normal, mild carbon impairment, dementia, and I'm just checking the boxes at that point. So uh, use the HPI, very uh, history present analyst, and all the questionnaires to drive what I'm doing in my evaluation. Okay, before we get on to different dementias, I want to talk a little bit about the diagnosis from MCI to Alzheimer's disease. What, I mean, you know, the reaction of the patient and caregiver when they're given an MCI is generally, oh, phew, it's not Alzheimer's, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, it's kind of like, okay, I know I'm experiencing memory problems, but it's not as bad as that Alzheimer's diagnosis, right? But yeah. what is it that, that how do we know when MCI is Alzheimer's disease? And especially as a neurologist, how do you diagnose that? I, I certainly know a lot of GPs are giving MCI diagnosis and not mm. knowing if it's Alzheimer's yet. And I think these are the terms that people kind of mix, uh, kind of mix and match. The fact is, is that MCI as a categorical definition means, uh, like I said, cognitive impairment without functional impairment. The, the term MCI only is a descriptive term, and the charge is to figure out what is the cause of MCI. So I will call people mild cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's disease if I have the CSF or the PAD or something else. And then, or Lewy body or Parkinson's or frontal temporal dementia. So you always say MCI due to dot, 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 or dementia due to dot, dot, dot. So I always start with the categorical definition and the etiological definition. And so people will say, oh, Hugh, I don't have Alzheimer's. I'm like, well, you have MCI. And you're showing biologically changes 
that will lead to dementia and Alzheimer's dementia in particular. So I spend a lot of time explaining that. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about those changes too, because I'm um, assuming that, I mean, now we have blood tests to detect beta amyloid plaque. Um, usually, though, but that's that's really only available to people in trials. It's not usually presented to the patient yet. Could it coming, but not yet, right? I actually started ordering them to, uh, last week in the clinic. Okay, so it's just, I mean, I am assuming right now you're rare. I'm not. Yeah. I'm, I'm you know, we're, most, I'm very rare. Yeah, yeah most people we're on the front the end doctor. of everything, so we get to do it all before everybody else does. So that's what's cool about my job. So, okay, blood tests are much better because a blood test is a blood test. It's much more affordable. Um, but most people won't have that option right now. Um, you know, we know that PET scans detect plaque, um, but those are hugely expensive and haven't been until the new medications um, been covered by insurance. So it, most people wouldn't get a PET scan, put it that way. Correct. Um, so how do you diagnose, like, I, I assume when you're talking about the biological changes, you're talking about plaque in the brain. Is that Correct. right? Amyloid and tau. Correct. Amyloid and tau. Right. So Without a blood test, um, we can talk about the blood test in a second um, because it, yeah. it is getting really interesting. But assuming most people don't have access to the blood, blood test unless they're in a trial or something like that, Correct. then how does a doctor determine whether or not there's there's plaque or tau um, other than doing a PET or a spinal tap? I do the spinal tap and I recommend it. And uh, uh, PET scans, you're right, are still out of reach for most people we're ordering about one a month when patients are willing to pay out of pocket and until there's a rumor in our world, as you know, that Medicare yes. might change their mind in the very near future, although that has not materialized yet. But the bottom line is, is I tell them to make the determination as to whether this is Alzheimer's or it's going to get worse. We need to do the lumbar puncture or the spinal tap. And they all kind of cringe. But the fact is, it's about how we present it. I will tell you, we do lumbar punctures for meningitis, encephalitis, multiple sclerosis, and a dozen, two dozen other things, and there's no reason to not do them for Alzheimer's. I do them in my office. We do them across the street in the radiology department. It's not a scary thing like it used to be perceived. We do, it's a five-minute office procedure, and I tell them that. And we're doing them a couple of weeks in our office, and it's going fine. I do it myself. I mean the, the reaction to that I hear from patients um, about a lumbar puncture is it hurts or sometimes it's hard to find the, the area is really narrow. So they yeah. have to really, you know, so I think that's why it seems scarier than a scan. Yeah. Right. We haven't done it. Uh, we haven't, we, well, I'll tell you if there's a lot of reasons not uh, to not do it in the office, we'll send it to the radiology where they do it uh, under fluoroscopy. But a lot of times I do it myself if they're, uh, and it's about, it's also experience. I mean, there are actual uh, practices that have dedicated practitioners that just spend their time doing spinal taps. So it's not as big a deal as people make it out to be. This is the time that the popular impressions and the science are a little bit incongruous. Is um, are spinal taps a lot less expensive than, and are they covered by insurance? They're covered by insurance. All told, all costs, including the procedure and the analysis, uh, are about one fourth of what a PET scan costs. And they are covered nowadays. Uh, we need to get the authorizations for the analysis, not for the lumbar puncture. And the lumbar puncture is a standard neurological test covered every single day in the clinic. It's the analysis you have to get approved. Okay. And so, but can you detect, you can detect both beta amyloid and tau in a spinal tap or just tau? Both. Uh, two forms of tau and one beta amyloid. Okay. So we actually look at all. Yes. You look at all of them. Now, tell me, dispel some of these rumors for me. Um, is there is there anyone who has plaque? Well, there are people who have plaque in the brain who never get Alzheimer's or symptoms of Alzheimer's. Um, do you need plaque in order to have a diagnosis of Alzheimer's? Is, yes. So there's is no one who hasn't had plaque in their brain who has Alzheimer's. Correct. You okay. can have another neurodegenerative disease without amyloid or without plaque, but that's not Alzheimer's. It's something else. But in order to have Alzheimer's, you must have amyloid, amyloid plaques in the brain. 
But I think the confusion arouses because there are people who have plaque in their brains and never see a symptom of Alzheimer's. So they're, yes. the, the, the tipping point hasn't started with them, right? They have the hallmark, but it, it, the disease, the symptoms of the disease aren't present. Well, so the, the reason that uh, we're kind of, um, a lot of people say, well, you don't, you know, amyloid is not sufficient. That's partly true. What we know is that there is an inflection point where amyloid starts to cause damage. And that damage is uh, is through the tau and tangles and the spread of tau and tangles. So amyloid does not correlate well with clinical symptoms, as you know, but yeah. tau and tangles correlate very, very well with clinical symptoms. So it's the spread of tau and tangles that correlates with clinical symptoms. But the event that leads to the creation and formation uh, of tau and tangles is the presence of amyloid. Okay. So, so in other words, people can have amyloid in their brain and not see a symptom of the disease, but usually when there's tau present, you're, you're experiencing symptoms. Correct. And then when they've looked at all those people who had head full of amyloid, but never got dementia, turns out it wasn't the typical 42 amino acid. It was the 40. It's uh, what's called, called the non-senile plaque. In other words, their amyloid's a little different. It's not the, the stuff that leads to Alzheimer's disease. Not the bad amyloid. Not the okay, bad. So I'm going to throw. I'm going to throw um, a few common scenarios at Perfect. you that we hear Perfect. all the time. Um, the one that makes me most angry is a woman in her 50s or early 60s. Okay, this is comp. This is played over and over again in people um, who leave comments on our sites who I've interviewed. They go to their doctor, they're experiencing some something is wrong out of character, right? Whether it's no longer performing at work as well or whatever. And I guarantee you, 99% of the time, if they're that age, they're told it's menopause. Okay. Yeah. This is such a common thing yes. that happens. I yes. want to scream because <laughs> you know, we have people like Michelle Hall in our community who yeah. was a excuse my French, a kick-ass lawyer raised three kids and all of a sudden she's losing words and she's staring at words that she can't spell anymore. And doctors tell her it's menopause. I'm like, yeah. how is that possible that a totally yeah. uber confident woman who yeah. raises three kids as a full-blown career suddenly can't speak and can't yeah. recognize words and she's being told it's menopause. Yeah. So Take several things that. to say there, Deborah. First, I just saw a very important VIP in our in our uh, a board member of ours actually, uh, and she, in her early early to mid fifties, same complaint. Uh, it turned out her pregnenolone was super duper duper low, and we gave her pregnenolone because we do we have a comprehensive lab panel that we run on our patients. And Wait, what is pregnant? I don't know what that pregnenolone is. Pregnenolone is a pre hormone that becomes something that helps the brain work better. Ah. Uh, and in fact, there's a can we all take it? Sure. If you, <laughs> you, uh, I don't know if you know Robbie Brinton in the University of Arizona too. She's actually doing a, a clinical trial of allopregnenolone to treat Alzheimer's. Uh, so the, the reason I'm saying is that we repleted her pregnenolone and her memory fog got much, much better. So Wait, menopause, so is this, a, is this a supplement? What is it? How yeah, do you that's, a, that's a supplement, but it's, it's a pre-hormone. It's a so pre-hormone. So the reason I say this to you is that Pregnenolone, excuse me, I, I, that's a tangent. My point is, is that uh, we pre menopause and can cause brain fog. I'm not going to deny that, but that's not always the only issue. Okay, uh, I think that these are the time. Ironically, that's the time I have started ordering the blood tests because at least then I can say, well, it's not Alzheimer's, right? Your plasma tau is normal. Your neurofilament light is normal. Therefore, it's not Alzheimer's. Let's keep looking. And then we do the neuropsych testing. We check their sleep. We check their meds. We check their meds. We check their meds. If you know what I'm saying, people are also self-medicating with stuff that makes their memory worse. Mm -hmm. And then we check for COVID and we check for other things. So it's, I don't automatically go to menopause, but a lot of people do. Okay, but to the doctors who don't have the resources that you have, right, with the blood tests, et cetera. So refer to me. So, well, Marwan, you're going to take on a lot of patients. <laughs> Everyone hears you say that. Um, I'm not sure you have the time in, in enough time in the day. Um, but should doctors be giving women a hormone test? And is there a certain level of maybe the drop in estrogen that would indicate yes. 
that perhaps you have more brain fog. Yeah, so I uh, I know you have experts that can probably comment on that better than I do. But I will tell you, like I said, I have this comprehensive lab panel that draws a lot of things, homocysteine, thyroid, pregnenolone, a lot of uh, other things. And so what I'm saying is that I use that as kind of a, a guide book to start to target things to optimize their health. Because everybody who has a memory issue is not always Alzheimer's, right? You know, and I know you can have a memory issue that has nothing to do with Alzheimer's. I see still to this day patients taking medicines that make their memory worse. I see patients with severe problems with their sleep. I see patients with mood issues. So what I'm saying is that there are a lot of things you got to look at in a perimenopausal uh, woman uh, that is, uh, and yes, on it is the the chain, the delta in their estrogen that may have adverse effects on their cognition, but it's not just that. And I would look at a lot of other things. Okay, so what are some of the medications that you are aware of that impact memory? I think that would be helpful. Yes, so all out. tricyclic antidepressants, amitriptyline, nortriptyline, and imipramine. That's number one. Number two is a lot of bladder medicants. Ditropan, oxybutynin also causes a lot of meds. A lot of over-the-counter sleep aids, the Benadryl, the Tylenol PMs, anything that is an uh, anticholinergic, anything that blocks cholinergic uh, activity. So the brain chemical response for memory is acetylcholine. There are a lot of drugs that actually reduce acetylcholine. And a lot of the antihistamines, anti-allergy uh, meds that are the PMs of the world, Tylenol PM, not the Tylenol, but the PM, that's the stuff that actually makes your memory worse. Interesting. Um, interesting. Because I, I I bet there's tons of people on those meds, right? Um, tons. In fact, before I ever see a patient, before I walk in the door to see a patient, the first thing I look at is their medication list. And I am stunned to this day how often people are on meds that make their memory worse. You know, muscle relaxants, narcotics, benzodiazepines, sleep aids. It just takes your breath away. I see a lot of patients who, if I just took away three quarters of their meds, their cognition would clear up. If I fixed their sleep, their cognition would clear up. So there are a lot of reasons to have memory issues that are not Alzheimer's. It's super interesting. I'm so glad you're telling us this. Um, I, I had no idea that so many of those uh, medications interfere. Okay, I want to I want to turn to different dementias because yep. we have so many people. I okay, I believe again, not a scientist from my very unscientific poll of talking to hundreds of people who have been impacted by dementia. I believe that Lewy body dementia is the most misdiagnosed dementia out there, and I think there's actually more people out there with Lewy body who don't know it than there are other dementias. Do you do you agree with me or not? One hundred percent agree with you. It is the second most common type of dementia, and nobody's ever heard of it. And until Robin Williams had it, uh, and then the list goes on. Casey Kasem, remember Casey Kasem? Yeah, he died of Lewy body dementia. Oh, I didn't know. Ted that. Turner has Lewy body dementia. That's a very common condition that nobody's ever heard of. And so they look at me like, what's that? But I completely agree with you that it's underdiagnosed, misdiagnosed, and often missed. I, I want to tell you about, and I bring him up a lot, Don Kent, who um, a member of our community, He, I interviewed him. He went to seven neurologists before he got a, um, a diagnosis of Lewy body. Mayo finally diagnosed him because... When he was eating, what was sweet tasted salty and salty tasted sweet. They were like, that's a hallucination. You have Lewy body dementia, you know? Yeah. I mean, it wasn't cool. that simple, but obviously yeah. he was being, because Lewy body is typically classified first with hallucination. So tell me a little bit, or at least that's yeah. what we hear. You tell me, how do you diagnose someone with Lewy yeah. body dementia? And what <laughs> questions should people be asking their doctor to get a better diagnosis? So the core criteria are Parkinson change, uh, motor change, Parkinson motor change, and cognitive coming close together, meaning within a year or two of each other. Hallucinations, where they see things that are not there. Fluctuations, meaning they're better, worse, better, worse, better, worse. And then the last thing is acting out dreams. I have to tell you, I know you know Jim Galvin very well. He's probably been a guest on your program. Jim Galvin is at University of Miami. He created a screening questionnaire called the Lewy Body Clinical Rating Scale. I actually use it in my medical practice every day, every time I see a patient. And it's a great screening tool for Lewy Body Dementia. 
And if they score above six, there's a high probability of Lewy body. And if it's below three, it's it's a low probability of Lewy body dementia. And I actually use it so much, I embedded it in my electronic medical record. And I have I can tell you the score of every single patient I've seen. And if the score is high, already I'm driving down that road. So I'm looking for all those core criteria. Are, are there two? Are there different types of Lewy body? Like one that's more closely related to Parkinson's, isn't there? Lewy yeah, body so, Parkinson's versus not, or something? Yeah. So the UK people, the experts, the real world experts are uh, the people in Newcastle and other places in the UK. Uh, Diamond, excuse me, uh, 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 Ian McKeith and his colleagues. And the reason I tell you that is they believe there's a psychotic variant and then there's a motor variant meaning that there's people who have a lot of hallucinations and other people have mostly motor and Parkinson changes. I honestly, I'm not sophisticated enough to differentiate. If I call it Lewy body, I'm not going with the subvariants. I'm saying it's Lewy body. So are you asking, tell us what are some of the questions on, on that? Um, I mean, uh, uh, hallucinations obviously is one of them, but what, what do you ask people to determine and what would make you think if someone comes to the doctor, you know, to you and says, uh, I, my memory is not good. I'm, I'm not myself, you know, what do you, how do you di differentiate at that early stage, um, yeah. you know, Alzheimer's or, or Lewy body? Yeah. So I will tell you a self-report of a memory complaint, I would lean toward Alzheimer's, mainly because people are not reporting acting out, self-reporting acting out dreams. They're not self-reporting whether they're hallucinating or not. So uh, 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 I would have to see other complaints from self-report to make that determination. I would also have to look at their clock draw. So, you know, we do the mocha, you were talking about the mocha. Yeah. I'm sure your mom aced the, the drawing of the actually, clock. Actually, the clock was the hardest part. I actually think the clock is the best um, diagnostic of the MOCA. Because You know that a lot of people agree with you on that, right? There's a company in Boston called Linus Health. They have done a digital clock draw, and I, they believe the same thing as you do, that the clock draw is an extraordinarily accurate test. And if, they, if they're very mildly affected, but they're having trouble drawing a clock, I start to think about Louis body, certainly. But I mean, it would be the same for Alzheimer's, wouldn't it? The clock would be difficult. Not necessarily. You can have a use not as a, not as egregiously impaired. Okay, it's interesting. Because I I also think the translation of multiple layers of information with the the clock is what makes it difficult. Because with Alzheimer's, you start to lose your ability to multitask, right? Yes. I mean, that we have that all the time. And in a way, reading a clock is kind of multitasking because you're thinking the hands aren't literal, you know, 10 to two isn't, yes. you know, or 20 to two, whatever. So, um, and you have so many different layers. So I, I, I've i always thought that's probably the reason why it's so difficult. Yes multiple multitasking right uh it has both organizational and visual spatial as so yes the multitasking okay so um what should people be at, what's the first thing well what should patients be insisting on if they go to a gp they're not at a neurologist um like yourself who's very experienced in diagnosing what are some of the questions they should be asking um you're talking the physician or the patient the patient. The patient should be asking about the new blood tests, the new scans, the new technologies. They should not be letting doctors dismiss their complaints. Uh, that makes me crazy. I have to tell you, when a doctor says, don't worry about it, you're depressed, you're sad, you're this, you're that. No. If their patient complains about their memory, they should evaluate it or refer on. That's the one thing I would tell you is tell the patients to keep going and don't let the doctor talk them out of it. Okay. Um, we got a question um, a while ago about um, uh, somebody who had really bad alcoholism um, and was exhibiting signs of dementia. Um, so this person wants to know, is alcohol dementia uh a disease and is it reversible or does it set you on the track? What's the relationship there with alcohol abuse and dementia? Absolutely. Alcohol actually causes three kinds of chronic severe alcohol abuse causes three subtypes of dementia. If you want to get technical, it's um, the Korsakoff syndrome, Marchia, 
Fabi Bignami disease and the alcohol dementia of Maurice Victor. But the point is, is that alcohol at high doses can cause severe damage and can cause dementia, usually not progressive. In other words, if they stop drinking, they may not get worse, uh, but not necessarily reversible either. So you're causing damage, but do people who are suffering, they obviously don't have the hallmarks like plaque and tangles or that's correct. They do not. But the the alcohol is is causing the damage. Correct. Um, Okay, vascular dementia. Um, How do we diagnose vascular dementia? So vascular dementia is uh, really diagnosed through the clinical story of a uh, sudden abrupt worsening in cognition that then plateaus and then abruptly gets worse and then plateaus. So what's called a stepwise decline and MRI changes. Uh, you you know, a lot of people have a little bit of uh, change on their MRI and people overcall vascular dementia when it's actually not just age-related findings. But a lot of, if you have a lot of changes on your MRI, you might think about vascular dementia. Okay, this is my confusion with my own mom. When she was first experiencing problems, she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, but they found the little like tears on her brain, right? Bleeds on her brain, which is, I guess, I could it, could do, yes. it could be normal aging, right? Yes. Like people have that with the brain. But what what's really puzzled me, and it's she's now in a later stage, so this doesn't apply. But in the earlier stage, it was the progression was up and down. Some days I was like, oh, she's doing really well, and other days I'd be like, oh my gosh, she's not doing well at all. Yes. This happened for a long time. Is that typical of Alzheimer's? No, that's not typical. That's more typical for vascular or that's Lewy body. That's what I thought. So yeah, no, that's more day, typical for vascular. Yeah. So to sure. this day, I have asked, does she actually have vascular dementia? But then do all of these dementias meet when you're in a later stage? So, so, so we know that pure disease is rare. Pure Alzheimer's is where you have plaques and tangles and nothing else. It's only a third of patients that we call Alzheimer's. The majority of them have other things like vascular, like alpha-synuclein, which is the Lewy body. They have, So in other words, most dementias overlap. Even vascular dementia, 90% of the time have amyloid plaques and tangles in their brain. So a pure vascular dementia where they just have strokes and no plaques and tangles is, is relatively uncommon. So yes, they do converge. Do, is the life expense, like, do, is vascular dementia, is it slower, the progression slower than Alzheimer's? Does it, or does it just, like, it's okay. variable. It's variable. What, what have you discovered in terms of, like, the progression of disease? Does it matter? Like, what, what are the fa- variabilities and the factors from, like, a, a faster progression versus a slower? Like, some people can leave for 20 years, right? Or right. More. So, I will tell you that having two copies of the APOE4, clearly, once that train has left the station, they're on the express train. And that has been really tough to see. I see a lot of patients declining very quickly once they have, if they have two copies of the APOE4. Uh, And then Lewy body patients tend to progress more rapidly. So if I had to predict the two groups of people that are likely to progress quickly, it would be Lewy body patients and APOE4 double copy. Double, not single. Not single. Okay, and then um, Milka is asking a question from our audience. She said, for a patient diagnosed with MCI, how effective are changes in lifestyle, exercise, diet, and delaying Alzheimer's? Good question. Very well. MCI. Very good. So uh, there's a lot of studies now suggesting that diet, exercise, particularly exercise, does slow the rate of progression, rate of decline. So the lifestyle factors should be implemented as early as possible. Okay, so you're talking about diet and um, like the Mediterranean so, diet. So diet is controversial, but clearly we know that cognitive stimulation, blood pressure management, and physical exercise have enough evidence to can recommend them. Diet, everybody's on a different opinion on the diet. So there's not enough data to give you a, 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 enough studies to give official recommendations around diet. But yes, you should be making changes in the mild cognitive impairment that are lifestyle directed. And then exercise, I assume you're talking about aerobic exercise, right? I am talking about aerobic exercise. Because we know, what does that do to your hippocampus? What do we know about exercise and the relationship with the, the brain? It slows the rate of degeneration of the hippocampus. It does. It's, it does. It's not necessarily making it better, but it's slowing the... the Correct. The, okay, got it. Marwan, you're the best. Um, Thank you, I'm so Debbie. happy Thank you. that we've had this opportunity to give our audience a chance to hear because I, I, not everyone has access to doctors like yourself. So thank you for taking of the course. time. Thank you for including me.
It's much appreciated. So if anyone missed any of this interview, don't forget to go to beingpatient.com. Sign up for the newsletter where we tell you about talks with our, people like Marwan. Thanks everyone for watching and we'll see you next time.